Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to call the March 22nd meeting of the Vermont Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel to order. My name is Kate O'Connor, and I am chair of the panel. And I am a citizen appointee appointed by the governor. And what I'd like to do first is have everyone um, introduce themselves. And when we get to this end of the table, we actually have a new member of our panel, Corey Daniels, who's with Entergy. And I don't know if you want to give us like a two-line thing on who you are. We'll actually start with Mike so that Corey can go second. Good evening. Mike McKinney, I uh, work for Entergy. I'm a technical coordinator for decommissioning. Good evening, I'm Corey Daniels. I also work for Vermont Yankee. I'm now the decommissioning director replacing Jack Boyle. Derek Jordan, citizen appointee by uh, the speaker. Lissa Weinman, citizen appointee, appointed by the State Senate Pro Tem. Jim Matto, also a citizen member appointed by the Senate President Pro Tem. Martin Langevald, citizen member appointed by the Governor. June Tierney, Commissioner, Vermont Department of Public Service. Peter Walk, Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. Oh, thank you. I'm Katie Buckley. I'm the Commissioner of Housing and Community Development, uh, the designee for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Bill Irwin. I work for the Vermont Department of Health and represent the Agency of Human Services. Uh, Chris Camp, the Executive Director of Wyndham Regional Commission. David Andrews, representing the National Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 300. And Tony, who do we have on the phone from the panel? Hi, it's Bob Gustafson from New Hampshire. Hi, Bob. How are you? Fine, how are you? Oh, good, thanks. <laughs> um, we should also have Scott State on the line, and I believe everyone else on the line is actually uh, just public participants. Great, thank you. Um, I want to make one announcement that Ski, uh, Steve Skibniowski, who um, was our representative from the town of Vernon, uh, has resigned. And he actually was here as a, to say hi a couple minutes ago. So I want to thank Steve for serving on the panel. Um, he was here from the very, very beginning, and he actually gave us a lot of insight um, not only into the, what the town of Vernon was thinking, but um, issues at the plant because he was an employee there and he's actually gone back to working there. Um, and he wants to enjoy life a little bit. Not that coming here wasn't enjoyable, but um, you know, we wish him the best and the town of Vernon is gonna be appointing somebody um, shortly, so we'll have another new person on the panel. But if Steve is still in the room, um, thank you very, very much. Um, I want to give everybody an overview of what the uh, plan is. Um, Joe Lynch is going to give us a presentation on what's happening um, uh, at Entergy. We haven't had a decommissioning um, update in a while, so we're looking forward to that. The main um, pre presentation tonight is the overview of the settlement agreement, and we have Mike Toomey here um, from Entergy. As Tony said, Scott State from North Star is actually on the phone. Um, and then we have Steph Hoffman, who's going to be talking um, on behalf of the state of Vermont. And we have Josh Unruh from um, the town of Vernon. And we also have Rich Holshue, and, um, who's representing the Abnaki, um, Abnakis. And we have probably someone from the NEC. So we'll get a good overview of what the settlement agreement is. And we have a lot of time for public and panel participation. Um, Scott State is also going to stay on the phone and um, give us a presentation on WCS um, and what they're going to be doing at the plant. And then we'll take a, um, a little time to discuss our annual report. So we hope this is going to be a substantive meeting and along the way there is public participation. Um, our next order of business is to approve the October 26, 2017 meeting minutes. Um, if somebody would like to make a motion and then we can talk about 
or you want to talk about if you have any comments or corrections at this time. Bill. Move for acceptance of these minutes. Um, Bill Irwin has moved that we um, approve the, or accept the minutes of the October 26, 2017 meeting. Is there a second? Second. Chris. Does anyone have any comments or questions or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the minutes of the October 26, 2017 meeting, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries. Um, next up, annually we have to elect officers. Um, we're uh, supposed to do it in January, but we did not meet in January, so we're doing it tonight. Um, currently, I'm the chair of the panel, and Martin is vice chair. Um, but I can speak on behalf of Martin. If anyone else would like to, to have the power, we are happy to let you have it. So I don't know if there, <laughs> I don't know if there are any nominations for chair and vice chair. <laughs> yes, Chris. I would nominate you as chair and Martin as vice chair. <laughs> Second. Um, Chris has nominated me to be, vi uh, to be chair and Martin to be vice chair and that motion was seconded. Are there any other nominations? Um, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, <laughs> I, um, We've been reelected for another year. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Do you see how happy we are? <laughs> um, now we'll start. I, if Joe Lynch from Entergy is ready, he'll give us a um, decommissioning update. And we do have slides, and I don't know if it's easier if we turn the lights off, Joe, to see the slides. about now <coughs> all right good evening I'm Joe Lynn senior uh, government affairs manager for Entergy and I uh, want to give you a overview and update of what's been going on at the site uh, since we last met which was November um, one of the key projects if you want to go ahead thank you Solange uh, one of the key projects um, that remains our focus is the safe movement of, of dry nuclear fuel to the ISPA C pads, uh, we've continued loading right through the winter. Uh, to date, um, on this most recent campaign, we've loaded 30 casks. Um, that gives us a total of 43 out of the 58 that will have all the fuel on the pad. And our target and our schedule is to complete that by the end of 2018. Um, there was a recent story uh, in the paper about um, the campaign being held up temporarily. Uh, I just wanted to uh, give people an update. Uh, we did stop the loading campaign about a week and a half ago when we received uh, notification from Holtec that at another site they had uh, an issue with um, the cask uh, design and we went through uh, an effort to uh, inspect all of our casks uh, before we go forward. We're still in that process right now. Um, I don't have a uh, expected date when we would uh, pick up the campaign, but uh, um, this is an effort that we feel is very important to make sure that we don't have the same type of issue that was identified to us, um, but we are uh, confident that we'll stay on track to have all fuel moved by the end of 2018. Um, at a future meeting, I'd be more than happy to give an update on how that evaluation and inspection turns out. Another major project at the site is to construct a, a new protected area around the dry fuel storage installation. Uh, we started that work back in November, and again, we've continued that work through the winter as the weather allows. Um, implementation of that is still contingent on NRC approval of the changes to our physical security plan. Um, the targeted completion for that is uh, coincident with the 
uh, movement of fuel. We expect to have that done by 2018, and that will support either our transition to Safe Store or in the event that the transaction with North Star is approved, it would support that schedule as well. The next slide shows a recent photo of the two dry fuel storage um, pads. As you can see, they're getting uh, fairly loaded. If we don't have completely loaded canisters, we also use that as storage of the containers that will eventually be loaded. Um, but uh, as you can see, we're making excellent progress on that regard. Next slide, please. These are a couple of recent photos of the work on the protected area around the dry fuel storage um, installations. The photo in the upper right shows some underground utilities that we're installing. Photo on the left shows the construction of the new um, central arm station, so that will be where security will have their headquarters to oversee the fuel once we have that all completed by the end of the year. Um, as far as our water management update is concerned, uh, to date we've shipped 695,000 gallons of water uh, to uh, Energy Solutions. The next shipment is scheduled for next week. Um, we continue to focus on efforts to reduce the water intruding into the turbine building, and that's been kind of an ongoing activity for the last several years and has shown significant decreases in the overall intrusion rate. Um, currently, the rate varies between six and 800 gallons a day. That is up from the last time I provided this report, primarily due to seasonal fluctuations in groundwater. The table does move up and down um, over the course of the year. And typically in the winter springtime we see that rise so we don't see that as any additional water coming in from unidentified sources and we'll continue our efforts to um, address those that, uh, that that we discover in the turbine building um, but overall that's been a success uh, one of the things we haven't talked about in quite some time is some of the obligations that we have that date back to the 2013 settlement agreement that was part of docket 7862, which was the docket that allowed us to operate to the end of 2014. Uh, in that, we had an obligation to provide $10 million to the Wyndham County Economic Development Fund. Um, to date, we have made $8 million payments, $8 million in payments to that fund, and the final $2 million will be made uh, before April 1st of this year, and that will complete our obligation dating back to the uh, 2013 agreement. Next slide. Please. As far as an update on the uh, trust fund, uh, the balance at the end of February of 2018 was uh, $570.9 million. And then I typically give a year in review. Um, so at the end of 2017 on December 31st, um, the balance was $581.5 million. The uh, beginning balance was uh, $561.6 million. We withdrew about $37 million. We saw over $61 million in market gains in 2017, and we paid about $2.4 million in expenses. Um, one of the things that we'll be providing to the NRC at the end of this month is our annual report, um, which we uh, report on the trust fund balance to the NRC, um, and we'll be reporting that end of 2017 balance. And that will also demonstrate that we stay above the minimum required funding that the NRC requires by their regulation. As far as the other trust fund, which is the site restoration trust, the current balance of that is $31.3 million. Uh, we made the final $5 million uh, payment uh, at the end of 2017. So we've met our obligations to fund that to $25 million. And over the course of the uh, uh, time that we've been contributing, we've seen $6.3 million in fund growth. So that's uh, a very healthy uh, trust at this point. And I guess I'll hold off on questions until a little later on, Katie. Yeah, that would be great. <coughs> What I'd like to do is when we get to um, the second half of our presentation is if anyone has any questions for Joe about the update, I'd love to do them then. Um, what we'd like to do is get right into the main portion of our agenda.
which is hearing about the proposed uh, memorandum of understanding and the settlement agreement. And I'm going to um, uh, throw it over to Mike Toomey first. And again, Scott State from North Star is on the phone, but the two of them have worked out how it's going to work. So Mike will let you. Thank you, um, Kate. I appreciate that. Um, we're, Scott and I are going to do this presentation together. He uh, uh, was planning to be here tonight, but the, his flight was canceled along with thousands of other flights that were canceled yesterday uh, for the, uh, the fake nor'easter that uh, didn't arrive, at least in, in the New York area. Um, I'm Mike Toomey. I'm the Vice President of External Affairs for Entergy. Uh, my office is in White Plains. I've got general responsibility for issues in the Northeast, including Vermont. Uh, I have uh, been a part of this panel and appeared before this panel uh, before. And Scott, uh, if you want to do a brief introduction. Hey, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can everyone hear me there? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there uh, today. As, uh, as Mike indicated, my flight was canceled into Boston last night, and uh, there was just no way I could make it. Uh, but I think this, I, you know, I believe we can uh, go through this in an orderly way. I'm Scott State. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of North Star Group Services. Uh, we're the counterparty to Entergy and the proposed uh, uh, purchaser of the site and uh, we're the party that would ultimately do the decommissioning work. Uh, I can't see, obviously, who's in the room there, but uh, I think it's you know, probably a group that's, that I've uh, been in front of before, and uh, I'm happy to, to be here or be with you remotely this evening to talk about the uh, agreement that's been reached with the state agencies and uh, to specifically go over some of the, the key elements of that. I understand as well that uh, it, it sounds like that DPS or ANR or both possibly uh, are going to have some uh, comments as well this evening. So I apologize in advance if the comments I make are, are uh, duplicated uh, later on this evening. Uh, turning to slide number two, uh, license transfer transaction update. The um, uh, original filing that Northstar did was December 16th of 2016. Uh, it was a joint filing with Entergy to the PUC seeking approval uh, for the sale of Envy, which is the company that owns uh, Vermont Yankee. And uh, subsequent to that time, there's been a lot of substantial milestones completed. We had a number of rounds of testimony, uh, discovery, and depositions. Uh, all of those occurred over the past roughly 12 to 14 months. Uh, in early 2018, in January, the uh, parties involved in this uh, proceeding uh, began to work in earnest to try to develop uh, a settlement agreement. Uh, those settlement discussions included all of the parties that uh, were interested in uh, participating in the settlement and uh, the results of of those discussions and negotiations and uh, the back and forth that went on is what we're really here to speak about this evening. So uh, slide three, uh, just as the introduction to the overview of the settlement agreement and the memorandum of understanding. Uh, those documents are uh, published and should be available to everyone to look at. Uh, they're fairly extensive documents, and uh, there's a lot of key parameters, and I, I just want to cover some of the, uh, the major elements here this evening. Uh, so on March 2nd, uh, Entergy and North Star entered into a settlement agreement and an MOU with the state of Vermont and a number of other parties. Uh, for those uh, that have been involved all along, uh, I, I think you're aware there were a number of interveners, and uh, so as far as the state agencies that have signed on, uh, it's DPS, ANR, uh, the Department of Health, and the Attorney General's Office. Uh, specific paragraphs were signed on by some parties, and the entire agreement was signed on by other parties. Uh, I believe the agreement uh, speaks for itself as to which paragraphs or parts that the various parties signed up to. Uh, in addition, uh, a number of the other parties that were intervening signed on. Uh, the Town of Vernon, Vernon Planning and Economic Development Commission, 
uh, engaged, and I thank Josh and Michelle for all the work they did. Uh, Wyndham Regional Commission, uh, thank you to Chris Campany for uh, his engagement uh, and uh, working with us. The uh, Abenaki Nation uh, of Missisquoi and the El Abenaki Tribe, I uh, thank Rich Holshutes for uh, his involvement uh, and a number of meetings that we had with Rich. And uh, the New England Coalition uh, for Nuclear Pollution, uh, I want to thank uh, Ray Shaddis, uh, in particular, I know Ray's not a, a Vermonter, but uh, been with that organization a long time. Ray and I had a lot of very open and good dialogue. Uh, I also want to say thank you to, to Skylar Gould and Clay Turnbull uh, for their involvement. So uh, those are all the parties that, that have signed on to the agreement, and uh, we feel like on the whole it's, it's an agreement that's robust and uh, in the best interest of of our friends in Vermont. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the MOU uh, that was submitted to the PUC uh, reflects uh, a few different things that were different than where we started, and uh, I'll go through those kind of point by point. The uh, financial assurances that we had initially proposed uh, both to the NRC and to uh, the PUC were enhanced as part of this overall process uh, and increased by approximately $200 million. Uh, the MOU also developed uh, and established uh, very specific site restoration standards uh, that we will adhere to as we decommission the site. Next slide. With regards to financial assurance, there's a number of components that make up uh, our commitment uh, associated with completion of the project. First of all, uh, there's a support agreement, which is a, a document that was uh, offered and uh, both to the NRC and to the state. Uh, our original support agreement committed to uh, $125 million, and we increased that to $140 million as part of this overall process. Uh, second, we also agreed to establish an intersparing escrow account, uh, that's a, a cash escrow, that we will fund at closing with $30 million. And over time, as we produce work and, uh, and uh, progress the project, we will put additional funding in to grow the minimum balance in that cash escrow to $55 million. Uh, our partner on this project, Orano, which uh, many of you would know as Areva Nuclear Materials, uh, has posted a $25 million guarantee uh, in addition to support the project in the event the, uh, that the other forms of financial assurance would fail to be enough to complete the project. Next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, recognize there was uh, concern about the uh, non-radiological status of the site. And so uh, as part of our overall financial assurance, we procured a $30 million pollution legal liability uh, insurance policy that is, uh, has been put in place to pay for unknown or not fully characterized non-radiological conditions. So that would be the typical hazardous waste or, or other uh, environmental conditions that are not radiological in nature. The next slide, Mike, I think this is uh, an energy slide. Yes, <clears throat> thanks, Scott. Uh, as part of the settlement agreement, Entergy also provided additional financial assurance. Uh, the first element is uh, you heard Joe uh, give an update on the status of the site restoration trust. Uh, that was a trust fund that was established as part of the 2013 agreement. Uh, that was supposed to be funded by us up to $25 million. Uh, what we've agreed to do in this settlement agreement is provide additional cash into that site restoration trust to bring it up to $60 million. Uh, the current balance as of whatever the date was that Joe pulled the information is uh, $31.3 million. So if we were making the contribution today, we would put in $28.7 million, 
and whatever that balance happens to be at closing, we will provide the, the difference between whatever that is and $60 million. And when we reach that $60 million threshold under the terms of the original Site Restoration Trust, a parent guarantee that we had put in there will be uh, released under the terms of the 2013 settlement agreement. Uh, and then the other thing we agreed to do is, uh, you know, through the negotiations, there was a request that Entergy provide a form of a financial backstop if all of the projections that have been laid out in this project uh, turned out not to be, uh, not to come to fruition or not to the extent that we hope. Um, and so Entergy has agreed to make $40 million uh, available uh, in approximately 2023. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but we have some claims against the Department of Energy that will bring money back to Entergy, and that, that's, that's related to money that Entergy has spent before the project is turned over to North Star, if it gets approved. Uh, that money would normally come back to us under the commercial deal. We've agreed that 40 million of that can stay with the project if certain criteria are met. Um, the criteria are listed in detail in the agreement, but uh, at a high level, it's if, if the project is not uh, in the, the status that we believe it should be, uh, because certain milestones haven't been met, if the cost to decommission seems to be more than the uh, uh, remaining funds available, and then if um, we haven't filed the litigation against DOE in a timely manner, uh, that $40 million would be available if all other forms of financial assurance have been exhausted other than the Orono uh, guarantee. So it's a way for us to stand behind the project after uh, the project is turned over. Next slide. And we're back to you, Scott. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Mike. Uh, the other major element of the, uh, the discussions that, that took place and the agreement reached was related to what the, the standards would be for site restoration. And uh, there's a few key parameters that, that uh, were agreed upon in this regard as well. The first being the radiological dose limit uh, of the site on completion of our work. And uh, as the, uh, I, I think everyone probably is aware that the standard for release uh, in a project like this from the NRC would typically be 25 millirem per year. Uh, we have agreed to a standard that's more restrictive than that. Uh, we will uh, clean the site to a dose limit of 15 millirem per year from all of the pathways combined with no more than five millirems per year from liquid effluents. Uh, we also agreed uh, to uh, attempt to attain a, a calculated annual uh, total equivalent dose uh, from all pathways of 10 millirem per year with four millirem per year coming from water residual radiation. Uh, this is a, a standard that has been attempted at other sites and not necessarily achieved. But uh, we've, uh, we've agreed that uh, we would uh, seek to do that if possible. Uh, it's a, an issue of uh, cost and technical feasibility, but uh, that's something that uh, was discussed at length. Uh, and I want to thank uh, you know, Ray Shaddis for working with us on, on uh, attempting to come up with a, an overall solution that, uh, that was workable for all the parties. Uh, we've also agreed to uh, complete a comprehensive site investigation and, uh, and require corrective actions. Uh, this would be related to non-radiological issues. And uh, we're, we're going to do that both with ANR and with the town of Vernon. And uh, we've agreed to maintain full compliance with Vermont's radiological health rule, which is intended to protect uh, workers on the site as well as the general public outside of the, the Vermont Yankee property. Next slide, please. The um, uh, project also includes uh, performing groundwater sampling for non-radiological components. Uh, we've agreed to specific requirements uh, as would relate to uh, those types of potential contaminants. Uh, we've agreed to characterize below grade structures that we would propose to leave in place, uh, this being the, the very deep 
foundational structures of the site. And uh, any concrete that we use as fill at the site, uh, that being any concrete from, from the site or from off the site, uh, will be characterized in a manner that's uh, been used at other successful decommissioning projects. And uh, we've committed to do that for uh, any of those recycling uh, material opportunities, whether that material is being recycled from the site or from some other site. Uh, and then upon ANR approval, uh, we've agreed to remediate the site to comply with the environmental standards applicable uh, for an industrial site. And uh, there was a lot of discussion around uh, what the future use of the, the, the site might be, and the parties agreed uh, to an industrial standard. Uh, we'll remove all of the above grade structures uh, at the site except uh, the ISPC, uh, which is where the spent fuel is stored, and those associated security facilities. Uh, the Velcro, the Velcro switchyard is uh, also going to remain. Uh, that's needed as a pass-through for uh, electricity going through the site. The administrative office building, uh, we had initially anticipated removing, but uh, through discussions with the various parties, including Vernon, uh, we have elected to, uh, at least as an initial matter, uh, decide to leave that administrative office building uh, to the extent it, it's of value to the town. And then there's a portion of the rail spur that we're redeveloping now that will uh, uh, be uh, released for unrestricted use, uh, but we'll leave the rail spur in place uh, as a, an asset to the site for its future redevelopment. Uh, as far as underground structures, uh, we will remove uh, without limitation foundations, piping, uh, contained piping to a depth of four feet uh, below ground surface uh, and to a greater depth if uh, necessary uh, to meet our site release standards, which, uh, which we've described above. Next slide. Oops, sorry, I got on the wrong page. Uh, we, uh, we also agreed to a comprehensive reporting protocol. Uh, this is to report uh, all of our activities on the site, uh, be, there, be it spending of the financial resources or reporting of the uh, status of the site and the status of the cleanup. Uh, we intend to have a, a fully transparent and public process uh, we view the NDCAP as a, a good venue uh, for describing what's going on in the site and what we anticipate to be going on. Uh, and so there will be very active stakeholder involvement as we progress the project. And uh, we've also uh, been in the process of retaining a cultural expert. And uh, I want to thank Rich uh, again for his involvement in that process. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, develop a cultural resource plan and we intend to do the decommissioning on the site in a way that uh, recognizes the, the past inhabitants of the land and, uh, and conduct our work in a manner consistent with, uh, with how work should be done with that in mind. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is the uh, NRC license transfer application update. Scott, I'll take that. If you go to the next slide, sure. which is uh, 13, uh, very briefly, as everyone knows, there's a parallel process going on at the NRC where we need approval from the NRC as well as the Vermont PUC for this transfer. Uh, that application was filed in February of 2017. We've gotten a number of requests for additional information. That's the formal term that the NRC uses for uh, discovery. Uh, we've responded to all of the RAIs that have been issued to date, uh, the most recent of which were provided in December. Um, as, as of the, right now, the hearings uh, were requested, a hearing, a formal hearing was requested by both the Vermont Attorney General's Office and by NEC. Uh, as part of the settlement, the Vermont Attorney General's Office and NEC have agreed to withdraw those requests for hearing uh, because the uh, approval of the settlement agreement is contingent upon PUC approval, which hasn't happened yet and may not happen. 
Uh, the Attorney General and the NEC uh, filed what's called a notice of anticipated withdrawal. So they let the NRC know that they're likely to withdraw their request, uh, but they can't withdraw it formally until they know whether the settlement agreement will be approved. So those two filings were made in March 7th and March 9th. Uh, we don't have any real insight into when the NRC will act. A uh, spokesman for the NRC has indicated that uh, he thinks that the uh, decision could come over the summer, but um, you know, it'll come whenever the NRC decides it will come. And whether it's an approval or a rejection or conditioned, uh, obviously we need to wait and see what that is. And that's the update. Uh, I know we've consumed probably a little more time on the agenda than expected, Kate. I apologize for that. Uh, we won't hold it against you. Um, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Mike. Um, now we're going to turn it over to Steph Hoffman, who is the attorney for the Public Service Department, and she's going to speak about the state's role. Thank you, Kate. <clears throat> so the purpose of our presentation was not to um, duplicate the efforts the joint petitioners just presented, but was instead to take a different tack, knowing that quite a number of people in this room, both on the panel and in the audience, have participated in this process since the very beginning in the form of providing public comments at various stages. And so the goal of this presentation is to give examples that can't be exhaustive, but to point to instances in, in the memorandum of understanding in which those public comments were heard and they're reflected in the language of that agreement. And we're trying um, through this presentation to just give a demonstration of that, but encourage people to read through the document if you can and look, look for all the instances in which we've considered these issues. So the sources for public comments to date have been both through the e-filing system um, that the PUC offers and then the public hearing that was held last April and also at the various NDCAP meetings. I've taken those public comments um, and reviewed them thoroughly recently and throughout the process and grouped them into five categories. And while this isn't representative of every single public comment that was ever given or filed, they primarily fell into these five categories, which will be the focus of this presentation. Uh, the first is North Star's timing and, and methodology. The second is the financial assurances that are being provided. The third is establishing site restoration standards. The fourth is ongoing monitoring by the state and, um, regula and the regulatory agencies. And fifth is public participation in the process going forward and throughout the actual litigation. So as many of you are familiar, um, North Star came in with a petition that offered to begin decommissioning in 2019 and no later than 2021 and to end in 2026, but no later than 2030. A lot of the public comment received in this area um, wanted to know how that commitment would be solidified and what ways it would be represented if, in fact, this transaction was approved. And so the two areas that the presentation here highlights are the memorialization of that commitment in the actual memorandum of understanding and in one of the financial mechanisms that North Stars proposed, which is a letter of credit. So this is just the language. I'm not going to be reading these portions of the MOU out loud, but this is the actual language from the MOU at pages one um, and to two. It carries over to two, where North Star has, has written its commitment to those timelines into the agreement. And there are various other places in the document where that appears. They've also um, memorialized their commitment to the method and their approach to that method links up with the timeline and various public comments were received on how they would be held to their, their task method, which is an itemized list of things that they would be doing on site. So this portion of the MOU reflects the written commitment to that portion of their plan. They've also proposed um, a contingent letter of credit and it's somewhat complicated, but essentially that letter of credit is North Star's own commitment to financially backing the timeline that they've proposed. So if they don't meet either the start date or end date, that letter of credit would be triggered and a $25 million letter of credit would be available to fund overruns associated with timeline issues. And you've heard pretty extensively about the financial assurances offered um, through the joint petitioner's presentation, but I wanted to touch on some areas that link up directly with public comments, which was 
how the financial assurance package would be structured, and I want to lay that out in a visual way for, for folks that are here. Also, some specific questions about the site restoration trust fund and obligations that were um, signed on to in 2013 that you heard a bit about earlier, and then the structure of some of the funding sources, and this is just going to be an ex some examples. They're not an exhaustive list. So it's hard to see from a distance, but this, time, this is a timeline version of the financial assurances you heard about just a moment ago. So the very left side of this timeline, and there'll be a chart on the very next page that itemizes these also in chronological order that you can probably read a bit better. But you can see the timing of the various financial assurances don't come in all at the front end, although the list on the left side at the front end of the project when the closing happens at the end of 2018 um, those are the most e extensive. There are, there are a number of financial assurances that come in right from the beginning. But you can see that there are various financial assurances that come in throughout the project, and those are timed um, to complete, as you can see, coming in about halfway through the, the time if it took all the way until 2030, but that black box represents if they finished in 2026. And then this is the set of financial assurances, and if you can see, maybe not the words, but there are a couple of not bolded um, items in the very second column, and then there, the rest that are in bold are the result of the, the settlement negotiation process. So all of the financial assurances that come in um, in bold there, but it excludes the support agreement, although there was an increase to the support agreement that you heard and then the contingent letter of credit, which was from the original proposal, but the remainder of the financial assurances that you heard about were the result of the negotiation process. This is one example. Um, there were quite a few comments about the site restoration trust fund and the obligations that Entergy had made, for example, um, regarding its relationship to this fund. And as you heard from Mike Toomey, a moment ago, um, there was a, an agreement in Docket 7862 to a $20 million parent guarantee. That parent guarantee was linked to the site restoration trust fund growing to $60 million. And as you can see from the language on the right side from the actual memorandum of understanding, that same $60 million benchmark was used in the settlement um, with regard to the trust fund. So that has been preserved. So there are, there are several um, examples listed here for the structure of the financial assurances. Various individuals had raised concerns about the initial proposal, and so when we were considering that, we looked at um, these comments and thought about what people were asking when we were going through this process. So I just wanted to point to two examples here. One is all of the site restoration trust protections that were provided in the 2013 settlement agreement in docket 7862 have been preserved and memorialized in the settlement agreement in this case meaning they were there's been nothing that's been changed about them they've been fully imported to the site restoration trust protections that apply in this case and then the second example is that the support agreement um, we took a look at the support agreement and in a portion of the MOU, we linked that support agreement directly to funding site restoration obligations because a number of people had raised that concern, how will this agreement apply if there are issues that have to do with non-radiological site restoration deficits and funding. And so that agreement now applies to the site restoration work that will be done on site. Uh, Scott State reviewed pretty extensively the site restoration standards. This slide just itemizes some of the main points that we had heard uh, quite a bit of folks commenting on in the public comment areas that I had outlined before. So screening of concrete fill has been addressed and standards have been, um, have been established for that process, um, both for on and off site. Removal of structures on site. Um, the I rule process has been memorialized in the agreement that includes comprehensive investigation of the site by a certain deadline, remediation to health protective standards, and quarterly groundwater monitoring. And these are all things we're highlighting because we also had heard feedback from the public on these issues. Um, there's also uh, been a section of the agreement in um, paragraph five deals with all of the site restoration issues that are here, but establishing appropriate institutional controls, 
on site and then filling all voids, regrading and reseeding the site. The next few slides, again, I'm not gonna read this. This is language directly from the MOU, but these slides illustrate um, a response to the concern for ongoing monitoring. And so <clears throat> there are several paragraphs in the MOU that deal with ongoing oversight. So this paragraph that's highlighted here deals with budgeting oversight, so maintenance, and accountability with regard to whether the line items are appropriately being accounted for and the withdrawals match up with those um, initial budgets. The next paragraph deals with uh, support agreement oversight, so how that support agreement um, would be utilized and if it is utilized, how the various state agencies would be monitoring its use. This is site restoration oversight, which primarily um, involves ANR's collaboration, but also involves the Department of Health, and, a, and in some capacity, the Attorney General's Office and the Department, who are all provided information regarding how the site is being decommissioned and how the site restoration standards are being fulfilled. And then finally, uh, there's a funding oversight provision that deals with sort of an auditing process for regular reporting, and those, that information is required um, to be submitted to the state agencies for review on a regular basis. And finally, um, I wanted to conclude with the public participation um, comments that we had received. Quite a number of people wanted to understand this process better and understand how they would have access to the information that would be submitted to the state, for example, on an ongoing basis. And there was one public comment that um, at one of the, at the public hearing last year that also talked about during this process of devising either a settlement or a litigated resolution and said, we think it's a very important that the interveners in this process are brought to the table and get to have these conversations. And I, I'll let the other interveners in this process speak to that issue, but many of them have publicly already. and we believe that this process has been very open and collaborative and it has resulted in, as you can see here, uh, four concrete examples where public participation has been memorialized in the agreement, whether it's with regard to various certifications that the information is going to be available publicly, um, all the way to North Star making, um, as you heard from Scott State, a pathway for other venues for public participation and comment receipt during the ongoing decommissioning of the plant. And so I will conclude with um, the, these are some state websites, the department and ANR have established um, some places for folks to go to get the MOU materials. I believe these will be available on the NDCAP website, um, this presentation will be. So there are MOU materials, the settlement agreement, links to providing further public comment, and updates to the schedule that's ongoing for the litigation. Um, and I think that Kyle Landis Marinell from the AGO just wanted to make uh, one remark about the NRC proceedings tonight. Thanks, Seth. Uh, just to clarify, I think there there is a little discussion about the NRC proceeding. Um, that's something our office has been involved with, working with the Department of Public Service. They're part of that process as well, and we've also worked with the. Uh, Agency of Natural Resources and the Department of Health in that proceeding. And then, was, as was mentioned, we did a, a notice of anticipated withdrawal and actually attached the settlement agreement to inform the NRC that um, we've reached a settlement and that uh, if those terms remain, then we anticipate that proceeding being withdrawn from the NRC. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you, Steph. I have asked um, Josh Unruh, the chair of the select board of the town of Vernon, to say a few words about um, the agreement that the town of Vernon has entered into with North Star. So he's here tonight to fill us in on, on what the town of Vernon has been doing. Sure. Um, probably everybody's seen the agreement in some way, shape, or form, or read the press release that the town put out. Um, March 6th, we signed an agreement with North Star uh, that kind of runs parallel with the MOU. Um, just securing the town, uh, providing us some help with uh, professional services costs that we've incurred throughout this process. Uh, we hired an expert to make sure that all the cleanup standards and all that kind of thing were what was best for the town. Um, 
all those expenses came right out of the town of Vernon's pockets and uh, Northstar agreed to help us out in that respect. Um, we talked about some of the remaining infrastructure that uh, we're hoping to keep on the site, uh, specifically the office building uh, that we feel will be vital to redeveloping the uh, property after decommissioning is uh, complete. Uh, pr pretty simple stuff is what we asked for. Uh, we asked that they consider us, uh, consider the town, you know, for any of uh, the things that the guys do things that they purchase, we now have a nice store in town. Um, we asked them to support the local economy in Vernon and they were more than happy to do that within this agreement. Um, the other big step to this is a tax stabilization agreement. Uh, that's an ongoing process that uh, we're gonna be working with uh, the guys from Northstar with. Um, hopefully, you know, have something put together to sign as soon as uh, the sale goes through. Northstar has been very, very good to work with. Uh, Scott and I have, you know, gained a good relationship along with Greg DiCarlo and Dave Pearson. Uh, and we feel that that relationship will continue to grow and uh, Northstar will do the town of uh, Vernon well. Thank you, Josh. There are two other parties who we've heard from at our meetings in the past and I've asked if they would like to um, make any comments and that is uh, I don't know if Rich Holshue from the Abnaki would like to go first and then we have Clay Turnbull from the New England Coalition so I don't know if either of you want to share any comments with us about how you feel about the MOU. Thank you Kate, thank you panel. Um, my name is Rich Holshue and I'm here representing El New Abenaki. I need them back. Cool by all, Ziwi, Pamlo Quick, one has the guy who is so far geek, Tony, Dakina. Greetings, my friends. I'd like to welcome you to this place that we now know as Brattleboro, part of the traditional homeland of the Abenaki. Why are we here? I'll just sum this up quickly. We've always been here. And we're still here. <clears throat> but the voice of the indigenous people has not been heard for hundreds of years. It's been excluded, marginalized, process called colonization, uh, which is ongoing. It began just upriver from Vermont Yankee here in Brattleboro, right here in Brattleboro. 1724, Fort Dummer was built here. This began the process of British colonization of what is now the state of Vermont. But we're here now. Why are we here? We're here because of our responsibilities in common with everyone else here right now. We have responsibilities to meet. Our responsibility as indigenous people is to the land. The definition of indigeneity are the, is the original people of the place. The people are the place, the place are the people. They are the same thing. That's a deep sense of responsibility. That includes everyone in the community. And when I say everyone, I mean all the entities that are here. Not just human. And present entities that are present. By present, I mean always. Past is here, future is here. All here right now. This is our responsibility. In the past, at Vermont Yankee, and this is typical, I'm not singling them out, um, whoever the owners were at the time. Um, there has not been a voice as to what happened there. Vermont Yankee sits in the heart of Sokwakik, this part of Abenaki country. It sits at the Great Bend, which is an ancient fishing place, ancient farming place, dwelling place. Hundreds of generations have lived here in 10,000 years. Do the math. We walk on the graves of thousands. That's okay. They're still here. They're with us. They support us. <coughs> Having these concerns 
I brought them to this within this process, docket 8880, the PUC, and I'm grateful to uh, acknowledge that there was a response, a positive response. We brought these concerns, past and current, to uh, petitioners. North Star has responded positively. Again, I'm grateful. This is about restoring connections and re-entering community, and I uh, salute that process. We met with Scott, we met with Greg, we've spoken with the town of Vernon. Um, these have been good conversations. I look forward to more conversations and more good things, restoring connections. I'd like to thank the, the petitioners, the parties, the panel, the public, all of our relations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reg. Clay. Break immediately following me. No. No. Okay. Questions are well, immediately following you. Ah, questions. <laughs> Sorry. I will be quick. Um, so, hi, I'm Clay Trundle from New England Coalition on Nuclear Pollution. And uh, although the MOU is far from perfect, it should be remembered that the MOU is intended to facilitate issuance of a certificate of public good before the Public Utilities Commission. Um, remaining issues not in the MOU, details of the MOU that are unclear or require additional action, and issues that arise as we go forward will have to be resolved during the course of decommissioning. Um, this resolution, we hope, will take place through civil discourse and in the public arena without recourse to litigation. Um, and if NEC was the only intervener to focus on issues of nuclear pollution, Four of our principal concerns have been at least partially addressed in the MOU. Early NEC testimony advocated for site residual radiation standard that would be equivalent of low residual radiation levels achieved at other New England sites and not North Star's proposed 150% higher radiation limit. In the MOU, North Star has agreed to try to reach the lower New England standard. It is important to us as every major regulator of ionizing radiation has agreed that there is no radiation dose so low that it does not have a proportional biologic effect. In this case, one third less radiation means one third less biological effect on the entire biotic community of and around the BY site. NEC will do its best to help Norster reach that goal. Uh, second, NEC advocated against the use of concrete demolition debris as on-site filled because of radiological contamination implications. In the MOU, North Star agrees to limit demolition debris filled to material from clean structures, nominally the cooling tower basins and the water intake structure, and only if that material contains no, that's zero, reactor-derived radionuclides. Uh, third is NEC testified in favor of an active role in decommissioning of knowledgeable stakeholders and community members on the model of the highly successful main gang decommissioning. In the MOU, North Star agrees to form a stakeholder group to advise decommissioning. North Star also proposes exploration of forming the group as a subcommittee of NCAP. NEC does not object to the exploration, but doubts that path can be made to work as the NCAP's charter forbids it from giving advice to the company. And lastly, number four, additional MOU stipulations to radiologically clear big bore buried piping and substructure voids for filling and to conduct near off-site radiological surveys of sensitive areas are very much in keeping with NEC's environmental protection goals and thus very welcome. Uh, finally, NEC proposal proposals to restore the site to its original natural condition and to set it aside as a nature preserve got little traction in the PUC process and are not mentioned in the MOU. And lastly, however, NEC will continue to pursue recognition of this site with its entire ecology as a living natural gift to this and future generations of this entire region, one that should not be further polluted or abused. Thank you. Thank you, Clay. Um, I want to remind everybody before we open the um, floor up for comments that the presentations that you saw this evening are going to be, if they're not already on at the um, NDCAP 
um, website or web page, which is located on the Public Service Department's web page. Um, what I want to do first is we'll have um, some time for comments and questions from members of the panel, and then we'll open the floor up for comments and questions. And um, so if anybody has anything they want to ask, either Mike Toomey, Scott State, Steph Hoffman, and I'm sure Josh Unruh, um, Rich Holshu, and Clay Turnbull will be happy to answer any questions that anybody has as well. Kate, I'm having problems with the camera. I need to change the battery, so it's just going to take pause one minute. Okay, we can pause one minute. I'm going to turn the lights on while you're pausing. You're all set. Um, we, be, I, Martin has a question for you, Joe, so hold on. Joe, uh, just a tiny uh, need for clarification. Uh, you said uh, there have been 2.4 million in fund expenses, and the handout says 4.2 million. So I would believe the handout. The handout, <laughs> okay, so for the record, it's 4.2 million, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Derek. Can I just interrupt? Joe, oh. I have another question for Joe. Joe? <laughs> um, you were talking in your presentation about uh, construction going on around the IFC if, 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 <laughs> if site. Um, can you characterize what you're doing to upgrade the protection around that site? Sure, so right now the protected area surrounds the entire industrial footprint of the site and one of the things we're doing as we transition to having all the fuel on the pad is to build a separate um, protected area around the two pads and then uh, a new uh, central alarm station where our security force will be. What this will allow us to do is have security focus on the fuel, which is obviously going to be the most important asset on the site and then it'll allow a little bit better access to the rest of the site so we can transition either to safe store or decommissioning if the transaction was to go through. So this is necessary to um, kind of separate the fuel from the rest of the site, which essentially be dormant um, once we complete the fuel transfer. Are you uh, talking about building like a barrier or a wall is or increased from what it currently is? It will be very similar to what it is right now, so it'll be uh, a very robust fence system with all of the latest technology for cameras and and uh, devices to you know ensure that we don't have any intruders. And then it'll have a barrier block system that goes around it. Okay. It'll also have access so that we can bring in vehicles in the event that we need to. Um, but that'll all be um, a very tight perimeter around the fuel. Yeah. Um, and very similar to what we have right now with security overseeing it. Sure. And, uh, Can you tell us how tall that barrier will be, the wall? Uh, uh, well, the actual wall, I think, is about a maybe a four foot high. It's, it's really not for uh, personnel, it's for vehicles. Yeah. So this uh, these concrete monoliths uh, prevent the vehicle from trying to get into that area. And then we have multiple fence systems that would prevent an individual from getting in. How, how tall are the casks themselves? The casks are, I believe, around 18 feet tall. So they're much higher than the wall that would be surrounding them. That's correct. Once they're on the pad and they're on you know, their own height, they are taller than the fence that would be around. OK. All right. Thank you. Um, the one thing I would ask if anyone has a question for Scott State, since he can't see us, if you could just tell him who you are so he'll have in context who's asking the question. So does anyone else on the panel have any comments or questions about the presentation on the MOU? Okay. Oh, David. Just a quick note for people who are approaching and during the break to please watch your step because of the cables we have on the floor here. Listen. Not really sure who to direct this to, but uh, the Conservation Law Foundation was the one organization that's an intervener that did not sign the Memorandum of Understanding. I'm wondering if anybody from the CLF is here tonight, or if anyone else present knows what the, the issues were for CLF. 
why they did not sign. They've been an intervener for forever in this whole issue. Yeah, I, uh, June Tierney here from the Department of Public Service. Uh, Steph, I think that's something that you could uh, briefly outline, don't you think? Thank you. So the Conservation Law Foundation did participate in all of the settlement discussions and were um, giving feedback and participating in that process and some of their comments were even internalized in the final version of the settlement agreement that was produced. Um, they did not elect to sign the settlement agreement or MOU and we have a litigation proceeding that's going forward for the purposes of the fact that not every party to the docket did sign the MOU, but there would have still been a final hearing regardless of if everyone had signed or not. So we've gone through a discovery phase where CLF did request the production of some documents. They have elected not to notice any further depositions, which is that process we talked about a while back where they would have asked live questions of any of the witnesses. Um, and so now we're in a phase where they're going to produce some testimony at which point we will know, have a better understanding of the remaining issues that CLF sees with regard to specifically the MOU or the settlement agreement. And then after that, there'll be an opportunity to put some discovery to CLF on that testimony. And then we'll have a final hearing the week of May, starting May 10th, I think it's actually midweek, May 10th through the 16th are the days that are reserved. So at this juncture, there hasn't been a formal statement by CLF indicating what remaining issues exist for them. You could obviously review the testimony they provided in their expert, through their expert Michael Hill during the initial petition, but some of that might likely re be refined and limited once we have their testimony in April. Um, for um, Mike Toomey. Oh. Sorry. For Mike Toomey. Um, you mentioned the the issue that stopped the work recently because of um, discoveries about the Holtec casks. Holtec being the type of cask that we're using at VY. I'm just curious, um, does in, has Intergy ever advocated to have um, a standardized cask created in the United States because we have so many different kinds of casks here that we use and it would seem that a, a standardized cask would be better for eventual potential transfer of material. Um, and also, can I just ask it, because I came into this process late, how come they use cast iron casks in Europe for the, the um, storage of the wastes not the Holtec variety of stainless steel and concrete that has been shown to degrade more quick, quickly. Well, um, I'm going to let Joe uh, chime in. You did direct the question to me. I would say that Entergy has been involved in you know the nuclear business for uh, since we built the first uh, the first plant for the for our company back in uh, the 1970s. Uh, we participate in a number of trade organizations, and and I can't speak for every time we've advocated for particular um, casks uh, over the last 40 or 50 years, so I, I, I couldn't begin to answer that. Um, I, I will tell you that the questions about the specific casks are probably better directed to Holtec, but Joe, do you have something you want to say about, about this? Yeah, thanks, Mike. The only thing I'll add is that the, the casks that we purchased are licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, so they have to go through the process of meeting the federal regulations for storing fuel. So they are fairly standard in design in that each of the manufacturers, and I think there's only several, um, have to meet the rigorous standards of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They have to receive a license and they have to renew that license on a regular basis. So we selected one of the designs that is licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That's how we arrived at the whole tech system. Uh, you mentioned that there was going to be a cultural, uh, I think it was, this is for Scott State, you mentioned there was going to be a cultural uh, person, expert hired um, to oversee the decommissioning process on behalf of the Abenaki. I'm wondering if, if who that person is, who they'll be, you know, what would their role be, and, and more specifically to Rich, could you describe any concessions um, that the companies have made that have made you more comfortable with the sale, specifically? 
Do you want Scott to answer first, Lissa? Um, Scott, then Rich, please. Okay. Did you get that question, Scott? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, the the cultural expert that that we anticipate engaging in, and we've shared the curriculum vita of, of this individual with Rich, is a PhD level uh, uh, person with a, a small firm that does specifically this type of cultural resource evaluation and analysis, uh, and uh, recommends uh, you know the kinds of processes that we would use uh, in areas that may be impacted uh, or, or may have a uh, cultural resource that uh, have not previously been impacted. Uh, so th there's a process we're, we're initiating, uh, obviously, in, until the, uh, you know, the project is set to occur, we wouldn't be uh, in a position to finalize any contracts. But uh, you know, I think that we're, we're going to use a a very open and engaged process with Rich and others uh, from from the tribe to make sure that we uh, conduct this work in a manner that's consistent with uh, how it should be done, you know, recognizing the, the history of the site. Could you repeat the part that was addressed to me? I'm just curious because you were party to this these negotiations, what were some specific concessions that were given that made you feel more comfortable agreeing uh, for, this, for the sale? Okay. Um, we went into this um, in, as a relatively unproven process, to my knowledge, uh, in, in New England at least. There has not been participation by tribal people in a matter of this nature. Um, we're, we're cutting some new ground here. Given that, and given our, uh, our complete lack of resources, this is all done voluntarily as a, a work in service, um, we decided that our best entree to the process would be with cultural resources. And uh, given the nature of the site, um, its heritage, uh, we felt comfortable with that. So we entered the process, we were given intervener status and uh, discussed this publicly and then personally with uh, North Star and they responded positively. As far as concessions, um, basically I feel that our, our requests were honored. We asked uh, and how that will play out in detail remains to be seen. Uh, we enter this with, with open eyes and in good faith uh, and with a handout. Uh, not a hand, well, handouts are great, but uh, a hand of welcome. Uh, there has been agreement to hire a cultural resource consultant, and um, we've talked about that a little bit. It's not solidified yet. Our hope is that the process that is put in place will be fully. Um, collaborative and cooperative. We are asking for um, uh, deep tribal involvement uh, as far as uh, structuring the agreement and monitoring the agreement. And um, that's, that's where it's at right now. And I have one final question for um, Scott State. Uh, related to your um, North Star's acquisition by um, J.F. Lehman Company back last year. The company, um, it's a private equity firm with assets of approximately $3.1 billion that acquired North Star last June, I believe. And they just recently, just a few weeks ago, also acquired waste control specialists. So I'm just curious about the relationship of North Star to your owner and whether those assets of that can we call it parent company, could potentially come into play should decommissioning costs approach those more along the line of the doubling of decommissioning costs that Entergy had originally estimated? Okay, yeah, yeah I guess maybe addressing the, the first question or comment, uh, 
JF Lehman Company it is a private equity firm and uh, uh, did recapitalize and, and acquire a controlling uh, ownership position of North Star last year, uh, almost a year ago now. And, uh, and yes, it's the same firm that did acquire WCS in January. Uh, those two assets are maintained as separate investments of JF Lehman Company. Uh, but from a management perspective, I'm the chief executive officer of both of those firms. And uh, I'm going to have a presentation uh, shortly after the break on uh, what's going on at WCS and uh, give a little bit more background as to the anticipated future of, of the site and the company. But, you know, just I, I will say that, you know, it was our objective as, as a company in North, in North Star to uh, maintain a close relationship with WCS. I think everyone here knows they've been a part of our team for this project uh, since inception. And uh, the opportunity to acquire that company and uh, make it a, an affiliate or a sister company to North Star uh, made sense for J.F. Lehman. And, and it made sense uh, for me as well. And I, I'm very happy we were able to do that uh, a few months back or a couple months ago. Uh, as far as uh, additional resources that might be needed, uh, certainly the, the uh, resources of our owners and our affiliates are, uh, you know, something that we consider and, uh, you know, the availability of those resources uh, is something that would be, you know, not uh, contractually obligated. Certainly, you know, the, the ownership of North Star and the ownership of WCS wouldn't walk away from this project if it uh, felt like there was uh, some level of additional resource that might be needed. Uh, you know, I, I would point to the, you know, the, the key element of financial assurance here is the uh, multiple layers of support that, that we put forward as direct support to the project. Uh, but our ownership is, is knowledgeable in this uh, business space uh, John Lehman, uh, many years ago, was the Secretary of the Navy. He's got knowledge of uh, the nuclear arena, and uh, you know their their involvement with us and with WCS is directly related to their overall interest in in uh, nuclear projects and cleaning up nuclear sites. And uh, as such, you know we we feel fortunate to have uh, an investor that understands what we do and is supportive uh, in, in our business mission. Uh, thank you very much. Um, what I want to do, unless there's any other comments or, um, or questions from the panel, is go to public comment. Is that okay with everybody? Um, now it's time for any members of the public, if you have any comments or questions. What I'd ask is that you come up to the podium, and if you could give us your name and what town you're from, that would be extremely helpful. And I'd also ask if you could keep it shorter then longer, so if you know we have enough time to get as many things as we want. Guy. Uh, I'm Guy Page from Modern Energy Partnership. I live in Berlin. Uh, I'm sort of curious about the, the cultural site. Uh, has there been a, uh, is there an expectation of discovery of artifacts of some kind? Uh, uh, have, have have they been found? I'm just, I'm just sort of curious what the, uh, what sort of the, the, the hope of uh, what, what, what there is on, on site. Rich, would you like to answer that question? Sure. Thank you. Uh, very good question. What's this all about? Uh, we don't really know. And that's why we're doing it. Uh, when the plant was built under the uh, Atomic Energy Commission at the time, there was no complete survey made of the site, uh, even though the laws were on the books. That's in black and white. Um, so you're starting at zero. Um, given the nature of the site, it's likely, but it's not definitive. Um, settlement sites, fishing sites, farming sites, and just the pure passage of time. Um, there are burials of record, north, south, east, and west of Vermont Yankee. So I leave it there. 
Um, what do we hope to find? Um, we don't know. Again, we don't know. We don't have a baseline. So we're asking for oversight, uh, for a survey, of a baseline survey of the site to understand what has been disturbed and what has not been disturbed. And going forward, if um, anything is touched that was not disturbed, that there be certain protocols observed. That's it. Thank you, Rich. Hi, Chris Williams. I live in Hancock in Addison County. And uh, I've been reading the uh, articles about the bolts. And Joe talked about the bolts earlier, but you never, the, you mentioned a problem with the casks or a problem someplace else. Can you, uh, or somebody from Energy, describe what we're talking about in terms of these bolts? I think the best person to answer that is actually Corey Daniels, who's our okay. uh, director of decommissioning at the site. You know, the, he's the new member who was introduced earlier. So, Corey, you want to take that? Sure. So, uh, and it, this is a technical discussion. So, offline, if you would like, I can probably provide you a little more of a description. Ultimately, the component of the cast that were described as bolts are not actually bolts. Okay, I've just gone by all my headlines. Uh, understood. They are a small threaded component, and they basically provide a small shim standoff, which basically holds something into position. But they're not a fastener. They hold no containing function. They do no pressure boundary connection. They don't hold anything together. But ultimately, as you described, the issue that was identified elsewhere we have not located with all the inspections so far that we have completed on all the casts we have and all the ones at Oltex manufacturing facility. But as you said, and you were accurate, our casts, while they're very similar, they're not the same as those ones. The manufacturing process is a little different. And we'll continue to perform our inspections. We'll continue to work with Oltec to make sure their engineering analysis and evaluation improves that they're adequate and meet the function and design for every condition they're required to. We won't start reloading until we have that. We validate it with our engineering staff. We beer check that with our corporate engineering staff. And then we've also informed the regulator. Okay, thanks. It's just the headlines were a little sensation. Loose balls. So thank you. Does anyone else from the public have any comments or questions at this time? Yes. Oh. My name's Ann Darling. I live in East Hampton, Massachusetts, due south of here. Uh, many of you know me because I lived here for 35 years. <coughs> I watched my son be in the National Honor Society right here in this very room. Um, so I just uh, want to talk a little bit about public participation. Um, that clause number eight in the MOU is pretty vague. Uh, leaves a lot of possibilities there for it. Um, but I'd like to say to Mr. State and to, the, and to NDCAP that I hope we can get a little more uh, precise here. Um, and that the public will be involved in deciding what the public <coughs> process will look like. Um, <coughs> We're not monolithic, the public. Um, we have varied levels of understanding and uh, about technical issues, and varied levels of trust or mistrust in corporations and the regulatory bodies like the NRC. Um, so I think we're going to need and appreciate some education, um, not only about the technical aspects, but about the regulatory systems and all the things that that are in that MOU, um, and uh, I, I guess I want to say that to me, public engagement or public education does not include uh, marketing presentation, but are essentially marketing presentations by corporations that stand to benefit from the decommissioning process. Um, and also, another thing I want to say is. It's, Public engagement, true public engagement means that the 
people who are doing the decommissioning can't hide behind uh, the, well, we meet all the regulations, we've met all the standards, and expect us to feel reassured. Uh, for many years, um, we have been dealing with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, and been told that things meet the standards of the NRC. And many of us don't think the NRC is um, really has our best interests, our safety, totally in the top number one priority. We think maybe it's a little bit too much in the pocket of the industry. Not, a, not all of us feel that way, and I understand that, uh, but many of us don't. Um, and I guess uh, sometimes uh, we felt a little like, because we're not, we don't have a lot of expertise and all the technical things that, well, we don't, we really shouldn't be included too much. Um, and you may, North Star and all your other companies may be technical, you may, you may be experts, you are experts. We are experts on our lives. And so a true, truly participatory public engagement process will respect us who are not experts, who respect us as experts on our lives. Um, and also grow out of the understanding that North Star is not only accountable to its shareholders, or assuming that North Star buys in the um, North Star is also accountable to the public and to many generations of people who will come after us. It's uh, accountable to the state of Vermont. It's accountable to the NRC, but we're the ones who live here. We will benefit or we will, we will uh, suffer. So I'm, I'm very interested in this in the public engagement process, and I want to see it be a really, really good one. Thank you, Anne. We're going to um, take our break right now because we think there's something wrong with this microphone. So if we can take our 10-minute break now, then we're going to come back and continue the public comment section, but we want to make sure we can hear everybody. So at 7.40, or we will be back. Hey, Kate. Yes, Scott. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't hear anything at all for the last three or four minutes. Like yeah. Nothing, zero. Great. Yeah, we're going to try to resolve that right now. Okay, now we've fixed um, our microphone issue. So Give everybody a second to sit down and then we're going to start. We're going to go back to um, the public comment period that we're having after the um, presentation on the MOU. And I'm going to give Ann Darling the opportunity, if she wants to, we're not going to make her say everything again, but um, whatever you'd like to say. Okay. This is on. What? Lean in. Leo tells me to lean in. Okay. Okay, so basically what I was saying is that public participation is really important. Can you hear me? Yes. Bring the mic up. Can Scott State hear me? Ooh. Yeah, I can hear you very well. Oh, awesome, because I really do want you to hear me. Um, so, uh, I just, I just feel that public input into designing how this process of public engagement will work is important. So don't decide what it should be and then tell us what it's going to be. Let us help figure that out. And my understanding from my friends is that the model in Maine worked pretty well um, and that it involved some training of the public um, about some of the both the technical aspects of decommissioning as well as the regulatory processes that are involved. And um, so uh, I guess the other thing I, I said is that there's a lot of folks around here who uh, we, we don't all, all agree on what should be done or how much we trust like the NRC or um, corporations, but 
we are all activists in our own way, and we know we have strong opinions, and we all deserve to be heard and respected for the fact that we're experts on our own lives. Um, there's a lot of folks um, like me who um, are not real trustful of the NRC and don't feel that it really puts our safety first. And um, so we don't want you to hide behind, well, we met all the rules and regulations. We really want to know what's going on. And um, we, we just want to know. <laughs> so. Thank you, Anne. Nancy. Hello, I'm Nancy Browse. I live in Putney. And I have a similar follow, follow up to what Anne just said. I do have some curiosity about the oversight of the specific aspects of cleanup of that site and also the over who's watching that those casks maintain their integrity over the years because even though I understand that the federal government is making an effort to try to move these things, I you know, I feel very strongly that there's a long way between the, you know, the idea of being able to safely move those dry casks. Um, I've heard rumors, probably true rumors, that they plan to move it on railroads. And if anyone hasn't been burying their head and not paying attention to the news, there's been a rail accident about every two or three weeks recently. And one accident with those casks is really a terrifying prospect. So I, I feel like given the state of the infrastructure in the US and given the fact that they're gonna put priority to moving the casks to, uh, to probably the older closed reactor sites like Maine Yankee and Roe and others that have been closed for a long time, I think probably we are going to count on that stuff being there a long time. So between the North Star work to dismantle the highly radioactive and dangerous reactor core and the work to, re, you know, to disassemble the other buildings, some of whom have quite a bit of radioactivity connected with them, and watching those casks, which regardless of what Mr. Singh had to say, there have been issues with cracking and issues with, le with problems with some of these Holtec casks. And I'm just wondering, I personally do not feel like the NRC is only the main oversight by the NRC is something I feel I can trust my family to. I have grandchildren that live in Brattleboro. I have a daughter that lives there. I have a lot of family around here, and I personally do not want my, you know, my family and <laughs> beloved friends to trust their welfare only to the NRC. And I'd just really like to know, is there other oversight besides the corporation that stands to it just basically stands to um, make money by doing a quicker job on this and a more just, you know, possibly, I don't know. I don't know what this corporation's background is, but I feel like I'd like to know someone is doing transparent oversight of this job. That means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Tina Olson, and I live in Brattleboro. I'm relatively new. Okay. <laughs> this is an issue that is dear to my heart. So I have an understanding about the rubbleization, and I'm confused. I'm not an expert on any of it, really, so I would like some clarification. Somehow, I got the idea that early on, I think it was Entergy, was committed to no rubbleization. And that sounded good to me because my understanding of rubbleization is that rubbleization releases uh, more radiation even, I mean, that it's not good. So you don't put back the radiation that is there. Where it goes, it, there's no place to put it, but you don't rubbleize. That was my understanding, and I thought, good. And then, again, I got the message, so that's what I want clarification on, is that there is no commitment to no rubbleization. 
and I don't feel comfortable with rebelization going on because I can't imagine how you measure this and who's going to measure it. And I used to work for a, a psychiatric hospital that had inspections all the time, and it was very, very difficult to do the right thing in a way. Um, very, very difficult to survey. And so I would be very worried about who's surveying the, the levels of what is safe radiation. And is that really going to be watched from an outside source? Yeah, so my question, rubbleization, where's that at with this agreement? And who's going to make sure that the radiation levels are as safe as they are from an outside source? Thank you. Great, thank you. Scott, do you want to answer the question on rebelization? Sure, uh, yeah, and I, you know, I would invite uh, the state to also uh, comment on that because this is a topic that was uh, discussed at length and, you know, and I think uh, Clay Turnbull spoke earlier about the, the standards we're using uh, related to recycle and reuse of materials. Um, and I understand the, the, the questioner's um, desire for better information here. Uh, when we talk about rubbleization, and, and we're not talking about rubbleizing uh, the site and, and leaving all the material on site, we're talking about a, a recycle reuse uh, process as it relates to areas of the site that would be demonstrated clean. Uh, and the, the primary areas of interest are the cooling towers and the water intake structure. And the process that we intend to follow is to recycle and reuse that clean material uh, on the site for filling of void spaces as opposed to shipping that material off the site and replacing it with like clean material. Uh, so we would be double handling material and uh, bringing material back on the site and uh, you know, running a lot of traffic up and down the roads, uh, burning a lot of fossil fuels, and, and it, it just didn't make sense to us. So we proposed a process which the parties uh, all agreed to that would focus on reuse and recycle of materials that are clean and appropriate for this kind of process, uh, not rubbleizing uh, Reactive, radioactive materials and, and just dumping them in the hole in the ground. That's, that's not what we uh, have proposed or what we intend to do. Great, thank you. Oh, um, Bill Irwin. Actually, I think uh, both Peter and I will just uh, state something quickly. First, uh, I think it should be recognized in some of the paperwork that was handed out tonight. Um, and it's also in the paperwork that you can read that the state will have uh, continued uh, opportunities to review the work that's been going on and that will go on there as it has uh, for the many decades of operation there. And that I just wanted to provide additional information that the Agency of Natural Resources will be overseeing that process of once of determining that the you know that the material that is being reused on site is also clean of uh, non radioactive materials as well. So thank you. Uh, Peter Hello? <laughs> Peter Vanderdos, uh, Brattleboro. Um, I would like to thank everybody on the committee for their uh, long, hard work that they've been doing. And I can only hope that there will be a uh, community oversight on into the future because I think we're going to need it. Um, also, um, I'd like to briefly add to what Rich was saying uh, just um, so that people have a better understanding. There's an underwater rock wall site uh, that has paleographic uh, indigenous markings which at one time was visible above ground but is now covered over by a waterfall in the center of uh, Brattleboro. Uh, also in the 1970s the state archaeologist uh, was called in to identify bones and artifacts in Vernon. Uh, he identified them as being an indigenous people's remains. So there is a uh, reason for um, that cultural oversight. I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks very much.
Good evening. Leo Schiff from Brattleboro, Vermont, member of the Safe and Green campaign. I've lived uh, six miles from Vermont Yankee for the past 34 years. Um, I try to give people and institutions the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I might even try to give corporations the benefit of the doubt. But then things happen. And, you know, when you learn uh, that people, institutions, corporations aren't trustworthy, they no longer deserve the benefit of the doubt. So I want to say that I don't trust energy. I don't trust the NRC. I am trying to trust North Star. Um, the challenge for me in trusting North Star is that um, I believe that you're trying to make money off of nuclear waste. And nuclear waste is a monstrosity against nature and humanity. And I don't really think it's something to make money off of. I think that um, our job is to protect future generations from what we have very unfortunately created. Uh, I also think it's very unfortunate that uh, federal preemption uh, gives the state precious little leverage in any nuclear matter. So my hope here is that the state will use every bit of the little leverage that it has and that North Star is becomes uh, a trustworthy member of our community in trying to keep us safe for many generations to come. Thank you. My name is Leslie Sullivan Sachs. I live in Brattleboro. I'm, I'm with the Safe and Green campaign. Um, I just had a piece published in Vermont Digger and in the Commons yesterday that basically would be my remarks here today. Um, but I won't read them. I'll put them over there on the table and let you pick them up. But essentially, I wrote them because when this meeting was called for March 22nd, I thought, March 22nd, why is that familiar? And they went, oh, March 22nd, 2012. Remember that day? That was the day that Vermont Yankee was operating without a permit from the state of Vermont. That was also the day that 1,500 of us showed up and marched from downtown Brattleboro to Entergy's uh, Old Ferry Road headquarters and occupied Entergy for the day and 140 of us were arrested. It was 82 degrees, by the way. Um, why did 1,500 people show up on a Thursday and take time out of their lives to do that? Because since Entergy bought the plant, it's just been one darn thing after another. And the state has had to spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of resources on every single one of those one thing after another. And I just pick a few of them in this essay. I re with Leo, I really hope this is the beginning of a new era, an era where we can all work together and clean this thing up on our watch. That would be fabulous. But we've been burned. You know, it's, it's hard. So go for it. Go for it. I do have one question. Um, when the state released the settlement agreement, there was a, um, a lovely bulleted points that are very nice. Um, and one thing it said was that there is one difference between the settlement agreement and the MOU. And I read both of them, and I couldn't figure out what that was. And I was wondering if anybody here could address that. There's something left out of the settlement agreement because it didn't have to do with the PUC. Um, thank you, June Tierney from the Department of Public Service. Um, Ms. Sachs, what I would suggest, if uh, Ms. Hoffman's not able to, on the spot, 
help you with that question, which she will indicate to me by nodding or shaking her head, you are able to do so, then go ahead and if it gets into a back and forth, may I suggest that you then take it offline and we'll stay behind and answer any more questions about that. Go ahead, Steph. There is a single paragraph that is different between the settlement agreement and the MOU. The settlement agreement, I believe it's paragraph nine, which there's a demarcation of paragraph nine in the MOU that says intentionally left blank. It is in the settlement agreement. That is the piece you heard today about the notice of intention to withdraw from the NRC. If the settlement agreement in the MOU form is approved by the PUC, then that is the one provision that is NRC related that is in the settlement agreement. Thank you. So good luck and read this. I'll put it on the table. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Dan Jeffries. I'm going to read these notes to make it quick and uh, to the point. I'm a resident of Brattleboro. Until recently, I worked at Vermont Yankee, completing 20 years there. I want to thank all of you for attending uh, these after hours meetings. Speaking as a resident of Vermont, I have a few comments about the decommissioning plan. I am for rebelization for numerous reasons. Uh, Partly the, the traffic, it was a good example. Um, I think it's a good way to approach this, and I believe that an agreement on uh, four feet of depth was determined what the restoration point was going to be, and I think that is certainly acceptable. I'd like to recommend that the site be used for a solar installation. Um, I think it would be compatible with a four foot deep restoration. It would be compatible with the rebelization. It would also provide a very small amount of compensation for the loss of the VY zero emissions power production. Establishment of a 15 MR background is uh, more than adequate uh, in my mind, being familiar with uh, matters of uh, radiation. Um, I have complete confidence in the process that's been used to get to this, to get this project to this point. Um, certainly interested parties have a, had an opportunity to make their case. As a resident of Brattleboro, I recommend the acceptance of the Entergy North Star proposal. And then I'm going to summarize some other comments, uh, and it largely relates to the integrity of uh, individuals involved in this process. And uh, to a great extent, um, I'm going to state couple things. One, Entergy always told its employees, when you go to these public meetings, take the high road. Don't, get, don't get involved in the theatrics and uh, the insulting behavior that the NRC in particular has had to put up with over the years. Um, and there's been a little bit of that tonight. Um, the last NRC residents that I worked with, one was a young lady and the other one was a gentleman. The young lady had a degree in nuclear engineering from MIT, and uh, the, the, the gentleman had a PhD in nuclear engineering from the University of Missouri. And as part of the engineering group, I dealt with these people on a regular basis. And I can tell you, they did not have the interest of Entergy in, in their mind, or they had zero concern about Entergy's bottom line when they quizzed us about matters at that plant. So this, this continuous kind of a impugning of the integrity of the NRC really annoys me. And as a taxpayer, I'm paying the NRC for oversight I'm paying the NRC to license these casks, and I know they're showing up with PhD engineers who are insulted by these kinds of comments that impugn their integrity. So I'd certainly like to see the end of that sort of thing. I've got some other comments about that kind of thing. I might just write a letter to the editor and fill in the rest. Thank you. Um, are there any last public comments or questions before we move on to our next subject? Seeing none, I want to thank Mike Toomey, Steph Hoffman, Clay Turnbull, um, Rich Holshue, Josh Unruh, and Scott State for um, participating in this discussion this evening. Uh, Kate, I'd like to thank you for inviting us. Uh, this is an important part of the process. and. Uh, 
we appreciate the ability to, uh, to talk to the public about the agreement. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And um, Scott is going to stay on the line, and we're going to have the pre presentation now on WCS. Oh. Right. And um, as um, came up in a previous question, um, in addition to being the CEO of North Star, Scott is the um, CEO of WCS as well. Okay. Uh, oh. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief overview. I know uh, WCS is of interest to uh, uh, the folks in Vermont uh, since Vermont and Texas formed their low-level waste compact many years ago. Uh, and I did mention earlier that uh, the investor owner of North Star, J.F. Lehman Company, uh, is uh, also recently acquired uh, WCS from its prior shareholder, Valhai Holdings, uh, a Texas-based uh, investment firm. And uh, upon that acquisition, I became the chief executive officer of WCS as well. And you know, I, I'll say just kind of broadly speaking, you know, as, as a company that's uh, involved with decommissioning nuclear facilities and cleaning up uh, nuclear waste around the country, we felt it was important to be uh, full cycle, full circle stewards of the materials that, that come from these projects. And the WCF site, uh, having been developed over about a 20 year period in a part of the country that sits on red clay, which has permeability far greater or far less, I'm sorry, than uh, concrete, uh, is, is kind of an ideal facility to put material like this in. And uh, you know, the, 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 there's really only two places that low-level radioactive waste uh, goes to for the most part today, uh, this facility in Texas and another facility in Utah. And uh, uh, we, we believe that the facility in Texas is, is uh, situated to be a, a real national resource, not just for commercial radioactive waste, but also federal waste. So uh, the slide that's up right now is a, an aerial photo of the facility, uh, essentially as it looks today. The, the large uh, cell in the middle of the site is a federal facility cell where the Department of Energy or the Department of Fence uh, can move materials uh, you know, from places like Hanford or Oak Ridge where those materials are not as well contained as they would be in a disposal facility like this. The compact facility, which by size is actually much smaller just to the right, is the facility that's uh, regulated under the Texas Compact. And, and that's the facility that uh, the, the Class A radioactive waste that is generated from the decommissioning of Vermont Yankee will be going into. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, just a, a general overview of the, the types of waste that, uh, that do go into uh, the site in Texas. Uh, commercial waste, which would be waste coming out of reactors, both operational and decommissioning waste. Federal waste, uh, which is coming out of uh, cleanup of the nuclear weapons complex. Uh, low activity waste uh, is uh, you know, materials that maybe come out of other types of processing, uh, things like the Marcellus oil shale area, there's low activity waste that gets generated there. Uh, transportation in and out of the site is both by truck and by rail. And, uh, and then there's processing of materials to uh, Properly de properly dewater, stabilize, package. Uh, it's a very robust disposal system there, uh, far more robust than anything that's done anywhere else in the country. Next slide, please. The uh, the regulatory uh, and and commission oversight for the facility is done largely by the state of Texas. Uh, Texas is in, in an agreement state, so uh, under, that pro under that approach, the uh, Texas uh, agencies oversee the site. TCEQ is the uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. They are the primary regulator. They have resident inspectors that 
review all the waste shipments coming into the site and the disposal of those materials. Uh, within the TCEQ, there are a couple divisions that we primarily work with, the radioactive materials division and the industrial and hazardous waste uh, division uh, have the primary oversight and, and permitting of the facility. Uh, the Texas Department of State and Health Services is the regulator for transportation of low-level radioactive waste in Texas. Uh, and then the, the Texas Low-Level Radioactive Waste Disposal Compact Commission is the uh, uh, compact that Vermont is party to. There are eight uh, members of that commission, uh, two members from Vermont and six from the state of Texas. Uh, and then the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has uh, some, some oversight as well for anything that might be deemed special nuclear material uh, and any exemptions associated with that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the site itself, just in terms of the volumes of materials that uh, could ultimately be disposed here, uh, the compact disposal facility for Class A, B, and C waste, uh, those are just uh, uh, differing levels of, of radioactivity, uh, C being the most and A being the least. Uh, that compact cell is 9 million cubic feet. and uh, the uh, disposal there, as I indicated, Vermont Yankee would uh, be disposed in that cell, as will uh, other reactors around the country. The federal cell is 26 million cubic feet, and uh, uh, upon uh, filling that facility or, or getting the facility to the point where there's no more materials to dispose in it, uh, the Department of Energy uh, actually takes ownership of that and has... Uh, the post-closure uh, obligation in perpetuity. And then uh, the treatment storage and disposal facility on the site is, uh, is geared towards um, processing materials uh, so that they are appropriately put in the correct disposal cell. The current licensing for WCS runs through September of 2024 uh, with a provision for 10-year uh, renewals thereafter. Next slide, please. The, uh, the site also has a, a permitted RECRA TSD, or Treatment and Storage uh, Subtitle C landfill, uh, set up for hazardous and industrial waste. Uh, that particular cell is, uh, is for, has 30,000 cubic yards of capacity today. Uh, it's being expanded to uh, 340,000 cubic yards, and that process is near completion. Uh, that's for various uh, record type wastes and uh, exempt low-level Class A materials, uh, low-level being uh, uh, less than 10% of the uh, Class A limits for uh, uh, radioactive waste. And um, the... Uh, a permitted landfill capacity is uh, 4.9 million cubic yards. So uh, all in all, the, the site itself sits on 14,000 acres. There's large buffer zones to the surrounding areas. There's a number of other disposal facilities in that part of the state, uh, primarily for drilling waste and that sort of thing. Uh, this facility uh, was constructed over a, an extended period of time at a total investment of about $700 million. Uh, it was built right, it's built for the long haul, and uh, it's, uh, a good, it's a good place to take materials that otherwise are uh, scattered around the country in not nearly as stable form. Next slide, please. Prior to uh, the J.F. Lehman acquisition uh, back in 2016, uh, an application had been filed by WCS to build a, cent a consolidated interim storage facility, uh, and that would be for the casks of spent nuclear fuel. Uh, that was suspended uh, about a year ago, and uh, just recently we announced that we were going to start that uh, review process again with the NRC. 
the purpose of this is not for a, a permanent disposal location for spent nuclear fuel. It is truly an interim facility. The, the sizing of the facility is not large enough to take all of the spent fuel that currently exi exists in the United States today. Uh, what it does do is consolidate uh, material from multiple locations. Uh, a lot of orphan sites, uh, for example, all of the old Yankee sites, uh, those locations, as well as Vermont Yankee, uh, a few years from now, will have just these spent fuel installations and uh, bringing that material to one central location where it can be properly monitored and ultimately prepared to go to permanent disposal wherever that might be is the objective of, of that business uh, enterprise. Uh, the configuration of how we're going to do this is a little different than it had previously been considered. The Orano, formerly Arriva uh, group, is going to be a partner in this as opposed to just a supplier. And uh, we felt it was important to get their technology as it relates to the canisters and transportation of materials, which they do uh, thousands of metric tons every year uh, of spent fuel they move around Europe. Uh, but uh, they, they were a part of this as a team member, but now they will be part of it as a partner going forward. And the, uh, the process itself is expected to take a number of years. Uh, you know, we think a licensing decision could be reached as early as 2020. And um, the uh, process after that would be uh, a determination that, that these canisters that are at orphan sites uh, are ready and could be moved to the facility. And uh, once that determination is made and, and the Department of Energy uh, has come to some agreement, there would be uh, then a process of moving those materials and consolidating them uh, in West Texas and uh, keeping them there uh, on an interim basis until the final disposal facility is available to take them. Next slide, please. The, the last couple slides here are just uh, overviews of what this uh, site would potentially look like. The first picture we looked at, you saw a view of the existing facility. That's essentially the right half of this picture. The uh, consolidated interim storage facility would sit adjacent to that. It wouldn't be intermixed or intermingled with the disposal assets there. And uh, this conceptual drawing shows the, the layout. It's a phased construction of the facility under one set of security, uh, you know, optimizing and, and more efficiently managing a uh, larger volume of material in one location. And then the last slide uh, here just shows a conceptual drawing of what this facility might look like, which is uh, uh, not much different than the ISPACY looks like at any of the Yankees or, or any of the other orphan sites. Uh, these, uh, this array of material would be placed on a reinforced concrete slab and uh, monitored with appropriate security for uh, the time that it, it's uh, resident at the site prior to final disposal. So that's it. Uh, yeah, I know the, the interest in WCS is, is specific to Vermont Yankee and decommissioning. Uh, we will be moving most, if not all, of the radioactive waste that's generated from the decommissioning project to the WCS site. So it was important for us to uh, uh, control the the ultimate disposal of those materials and ensure that they're disposed of properly and that was uh, a driving force behind the uh, the acquisition of WCS by JF Lehman. Um, thank you Scott. Um, what I want to do is first open um, the floor to the panel for any comments or questions they have for Scott and then we'll do um, the same for the public and I just want to remind everybody that because Scott's on the phone and has limited ability to see us, if you have a question for him, if you can state who you are. So does anyone on the panel have any comments or questions for Scott State? I do. Um, 
Scott, uh, this is Martin Langeveld. Um, a, a question about the CIS um, proposal. Is this being done basically uh, on, uh, it, it feels like there are two stages. One is you're going to get um, uh, uh, a license for this facility and then uh, secondly, uh, the DOE has to agree to, um, to start shipping stuff there. And, and so I'm wondering, are, is this being done completely on, on spec and then, and then getting the license and then waiting to see if the DOE wants to do this? Or is there a, a parallel process and, and you know, how much does, doesn't Congress have to, have to act to, uh, to start moving uh, this fuel. I'm, I'm just wondering about is it step one, step two, or is it all one one process here? Yeah, that, that's a good question. It, it, it really is step one, step two. The development of the site uh, for use and characterization of the site, uh, the geological work, the permitting work is all being done with our own funds and at risk. Uh, it, it's you know, our expectation that if a, a permitted site is available, uh, we would have the opportunity to uh, discuss with DOE options to make the site viable for their use. And uh, we would then construct the facility with our own funds as well with a, a certain level of commitment from DOE to move materials there. But th there are a number of moving parts, as you indicate, uh, it, it really is impossible uh, just under the current regulatory structure in the U.S. to do something like this with a, a contract or, or payment from the federal government. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of like the field of dreams. You, you've got to build it and they will come is, is our view here. And uh, we, we believe that it's the best site available in the country to do something like this. It's logistically uh, on a good pathway to Yucca Mountain. If Yucca Mountain were to be the final uh, permanent disposal location, and uh, we're willing to invest our own capital to get to the point where we could construct the facility, and then uh, if it uh, is deemed uh, something that the Department of Energy would want to do, and, and it would save uh, the United States government a substantial amount of money to have all this material. Uh, especially from the orphan sites in one location, uh, since the Department of Energy has to pay to maintain all of these independent sites across the country. So, um, you know, we think it, it, it's, you know, we, we believe the WCS site is a national asset, and this is one of the things that we think makes sense uh, that that, as, uh, that asset should be used for. Uh, this is Lissa Weinman. Just to be clear, the whole idea of putting the nuclear, this, the spent fuel into the interim consolidated waste facility that you want to create in Texas through waste control specialists is currently not legal, correct? I mean, it's that it's it's you need require a change in United States law to do that. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. So, what is the um, why? Why are there several bills in Congress right now calling for the um, nuclear waste 1982 Act to be changed to allow? for interim consolidated waste to be sent to the, such a facility? Uh, there's a, another facility being designed uh, and permitted potentially that's, that's also been docketed by the NRC. And it's my understanding, uh, and I, I don't know this to be true today, but their original concept was one where, that would require a change to the law. And, uh, you know, the the legal status of, of what they're doing is not something I'm privy to, but uh, the approach that we're considering here would not require a change to the law um, as it exists today. My understanding is that U.S. law requires one permanent geologic facility which was supposed to be Yucca Mountain but which the government doesn't own, 
an Indian tribe owns. So Yucca Mountain doesn't seem like it's going to be a feasible facility in anywhere in the near future. And that in order to ship waste to an interim consolidated facility such as you're describing will require a change in U.S. law. And there's several bills to that effect that are currently in Congress. You're not aware of those? You're saying that what you're considering does not require a change of law. Am I hearing you correctly? That's correct. OK, that is not my understanding. Um, in terms of saving the federal government money, would you, are you aware of any economic impact studies that have been done to show that moving waste first to an interim consolidated facility and secondarily at some unknown time in the future to a permanent geological site would require quite a bit of expenditure? Um, are, you, are you familiar with any kinds of economic impact studies that have looked at that cost? You're saying that this, this kind of uh, approach would save the federal government money, but I've seen studies that show that it would actually be paying twice for the movement of such waste. We, we have uh, developed our own internal engineering analysis and studies. Uh, as it relates to the movement of fuel uh, within the U.S. And uh, I, I know there's uh, independent studies that maybe have been conducted by the government, but uh, I, I understand your questions. Uh, all I'll say is this, there's a proprietary nature to the, the business that we're developing here, and I can't get into the details uh, of what we are going to propose to do. You know, our, our process is one where we will spend our own money and uh, make a proposal to the Department of Energy and uh, they'll either find it compelling or they won't. And uh, part of that proposal will be to show what we believe are the economic benefits. And if we're wrong about that, then uh, obviously the, the government's not going to engage and move forward with uh, this as a potential site for interim storage. So uh, J.F. Lehman, nor North Star, nor Entergy, nor the Nuclear Energy Institute are involved in trying to pass bills that will allow for consolidated interim storage. Is that correct? Correct. OK, thank you. Um, does anyone else on the panel? Chris? Not really, not really a question, but a suggestion. Um, It'd be, I think it'd be helpful if at some point we could arrange to have the two Vermont commissioners on the compact come and present to uh, Indicap, just to kind of give us their perspective and what positions they're representing and that kind of thing. We will put that on um, the list of things to do, so that's great. Thank you. Um, does anyone else on the panel have any comments or questions for Scott? Um, seeing none, I'm going to open it up to the public. And um, this is the time for anybody who has a comment or question for Scott State on the WCS presentation to come forward. And once again, tell us who you are and where you're from. <laughs> it's very fast. This is Nancy Browse again from Putney. And my question for Mr. State or anyone else here who knows is, I, I'm very concerned about the concept of leaving these casks out in the desert sun that is extremely hot down there and then it Cold, cools off at night every night, again, bakes during the day, extremely cool at night. Have these casks been studied for that kind of conditions? Thank you. Chris Williams oh. from uh, Hancock in Addison County. I work with um, lots of different groups. Hey, and Chris. This past weekend I was oh. in Chicago uh, for a grassroots summit on high-level nuclear waste. There were people from coast to coast. And we talked a lot about your proposal, Mr. State, and we also talked a lot about the proposal across the border in New Mexico that Holtec is making for a, a similar facility. We also talked with uh, a lot of residents of West Texas and New Mexico who are revolted by your proposal. But I'll just leave that aside. I've, uh, I've raised money and paid for a lot of lawyers over a lot of decades. And it's my understanding that for your 
proposal to go forward will require uh, amendments to the uh, Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, which was amended in 87, and is proposed to be amended in the current Congress uh, with a bill in the House that's H.R. Uh, 3053, um, sponsored by Representative Shimkus from Illinois. Um, I'm going to be on the phone with uh, some lawyers tomorrow and would ask any knowledgeable lawyers in the room tonight uh, to comment as to whether or not the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, as it is written right now, has to be amended to let this uh, kind of project go forward. Again, it's, it's my understanding that that's what's needed, and there's quite a pitched battle going on. So I'm surprised to hear you say, especially because you're starting to pump money into this thing, uh, that it's not required. Um, I can assure you if there's uh, no uh, permission given by the Congress uh, to change that law, and you have some mechanism that's going to, that you believe is going to put high level nuclear waste on the road, you're uh, in for one hell of a fight. Thank you. Scott, this is um, Kate, and before Chris Williams spoke, Nancy Browse spoke and asked a question about um, the casks sitting out in the sun or the heat. I don't know if you remember that question. I think she was, do you have an answer or any kind of information you can give her? Yeah, uh, yes, that the, the qualification of the casks uh, and their duration in their life, uh, you know, all of those design calculations are developed around the various environments that they might be in. Uh, you know, while Texas is a, a hot, dry, arid climate, uh, you know, the, the, the cooling and the, the freezing and thawing cycle and, and uh, the kinds of conditions you have in the northern states, you know, also present uh, design life uh, considerations for the engineering and design of these uh, cask systems. So, you know, all of that is taken into account. The, the vendors for the casks uh, all have programs that are designed to uh, pro provide uh, oversight and maintenance and uh, inspection services to ensure that the cask integrity uh, is maintained. Uh, so, yes, those, those, those considerations are taken into account. All right, thank you. Um, are there anyone else in the public that has any questions or comments? Um, yes. Hello, John Tuthill from Ackworth, New Hampshire. Um, I had a question about the aerial photograph of the uh, byproduct facility, I believe it was called. And uh, it looked as if there were a smokestack associated with that uh, part of the site. Uh, it wasn't too clear in the, uh, in the image. But uh, if you could explain a little bit what is going on at the byproduct facility. And the second question is whether or not contracts are already in place with DOE and DOD for uh, materials moving on to the, the Texas site and the federal uh, part of that facility. Thank you. Yeah, the byproduct or 11E2 facility is uh, is not a much used space. It was designed for uh, things like uranium mill tailings and uh, byproduct materials. Uh, there are not any smokestacks, and I, I'm trying to look at the the view you're seeing there. Uh, that that facility is you know largely unused at this point in time. The federal facility, there is waste uh, that is shipped there on a regular basis from various DOE or DOD customers. Uh, some examples of the type of waste that might go there, the, the decommissioning of uh, various vessels that the Navy has, for example, that uh, were powered by uh, nuclear propulsion. Uh, those ships, when they're decommissioned, that material has to find a, a final resting place somewhere. Uh, it's far better to have that material in a geological, uh, properly designed disposal facility than it is to be floating around on the water 
uh, in a deteriorated manner. So there's material like that that's gone in there. Uh, the Department of Energy has shipped uh, materials there as well from decommissioning and, and disassembly of facilities that they have around the country. Thank you. Another public comment. Hi, I'm Tom Webler from Keene State College. I just have a question, Scott. Um, for the class A, B, and C waste, there's already a compact with Vermont, and I guess that waste has a price set. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but how would you, since it's North Star would be selling the waste to waste control specialist, and you run both companies, how would the price for that, uh, the low level waste be, be calculated? Yeah, the, the pricing for low level waste in the compact is a, a fixed uh, a fixed price, and uh, it's a, a published rate that's uh, managed by the compact commission. So would that be the same price for all the uh, decommissioning waste? It, yes, absolutely. That, there, there's a rate sheet or a pricing sheet for class A, B, and C waste that uh, is fixed for the, uh, all the compact generators. Out of compact generators uh, have a different pricing structure and, and by the, the, the nature of the agreements as they were put together when the compact was formed, it's a requirement that any out of compact generators pay a higher price than the highest price any in compact generator pays. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more comments or questions from the public? Um, seeing none, um, I want to thank you, Scott, for taking the time to participate, even though it had to be by phone. Um, and I'm sure we're going to see you a lot in the future. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Th oh. Thank you. Oh. I, I want to thank you, Kate, and I, I do apologize that I, I wasn't able to be there uh, this evening. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't believe I've got anything else on the agenda, so I think I'll sign off from um, here can, and uh, wish you all the best. Can you hold on one second, Scott? I think we have one more question sure. for you. Okay. This is Lisa Weinman again. I, I was really very surprised by your answer about the current legislation going through Congress because it flies in the face of my understanding of what's required for you to move the high-level waste to Texas. So I'm wondering, could you provide us with a detailed explanation of how that would work because I'm still not clear. I mean, it doesn't have to be now, mm -hmm. but could you commit to let us know by what process will you be moving and achieving the um, authority to move the, the casks from the ISFC to Texas at some point in the future without a change in U.S. law? I, I'm happy to do that at the appropriate time. You know, at this point, I, I want everybody to understand we've got a a process engaged, or we don't even have that at this point in time. We've indicated we are going to restart the process, the licensing process with the NRC for this facility, uh, and and that process is is tied to specifically the facility itself and the characteristics of the facility and its usage for interim storage. The transportation of the materials and, and the rest of that program is not currently uh, developed as part of that overall uh, licensing process with the NRC. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss at the appropriate time what the, the uh, approach that we are considering is. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I can't get into it now. It's a business sensitive uh, item and uh, you know, I, I think when, when we're at a point where the process of licensing the facility is more clear, I, I'm certainly happy to discuss what, uh, what we think is the correct process to move forward. Well, I guess it will all come out in the, um, the, the hearings in the Public Utilities Commission, but in order for the NRC to license the facility, it will require a change in U.S. law. So let's, uh, I'll look forward to your more complete answer in the future. Um, thank you, and thanks again, Scott. Yeah, thank you. Have a good evening. You too, thank you. 
Next up on the agenda is a discussion of our annual report to the legislature, and I'm actually gonna turn this over to um, David Andrews, and I am gonna admit a screw up, which I should have probably admitted before you elected me chair and I wouldn't have gotten reelected. Um, I meant to email this to you folks like weeks ago, but I, I didn't. Um, so you have a printed copy in front of you. We are gonna email um, the copy around. We're not gonna vote on this tonight. David will explain how we got here. As you'll see, it's only four pages as opposed to like 400 pages that it was in the past. So we'll just, this won't take very long. This will be just a This won't take quick. long at all. No. So as you recall, every year by statute, we're required to provide an annual report to the, to the legislature. And in years past, we had a little mini Bible, 20, 25, 30 pages. Um, I believe there was a working group of us that sat to discuss a better way of doing this, to discuss this, and we realized that the reality is most people, when they, they get a 20-page pile stuck on them in the middle of, in the, middle of uh, the legislative session up there, they don't have time to read this thing and, and digest it. So it's better if we gave them a short synopsis and followed it up with what we did last year, which was actually going up and having a face-to-face, a, a -face, which was very uh, well received with the, uh, the uh, uh, key legislators up in the, under the Golden Dome. So with uh, a number of really good comments, especially thanks to Chris Campany, we, uh, instead of giving a long detail, we gave a, a short synopsis of, of each meeting in about 10 lines or less. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, hyperlinks in here so that you can actually connect to, to seeing the doc instead of in, attaching them um, or, or, or including them in it. We've got a, a brief over oversight of each of the meetings, uh, the major milestones and activities that occurred during the calendar year at the VY site, the nuclear decommissioning trust and site restoration trust fund updates, beginning of the year and end of year balances and uh, deposits and withdrawals. Uh, the transfer of spent nuclear fuel, the Vermont Yankee update, what was going on with the dry casks, the water management program, uh, uh, the Vermont congressional delegation, and you can see we got a little bit of tweaking we have to put in there. Uh, the issues committee and the meeting schedules and priorities for 2018, we did all that in four pages. So hopefully by presenting this to the legislature, it, it, it doesn't fill up their desk, it gives them something to look at for future references, and it's a groundwork for us to, to meet with them in person and discuss what we've done and where we're going forward. Um, so again, I'm gonna e actually email it to you this time, and then we can take a look at it um, and approve it. What we've done in the past is we've actually even gone to the legislature before we've approved our annual report, so we'll get the wheels in motion about going up to the legislature, and then we'll look at, give everybody a chance to look at this. and. Um, move forward, but thanks to David, it's four pages. Um, at this time, it's public comment. I don't know if anyone has any remaining comments that they have. Um, for the panel, Haley. Yeah, and I wanna actually acknowledge that the congressional delegation representatives from Senator Leahy, Senator um, Sanders, and Congressman Welch's office were here tonight listening, and Haley is from Senator Sanders' office. Thank you, Kate. Uh, as you heard, my name is Haley Perro from Senator Sanders' office, and I just want to let folks know that Senator Sanders reintroduced the Nuclear Plant Decommissioning Act in February, and companion legislation was introduced in the House by Congressman Welch. Uh, you may recall the initial version of the bill, which I believe is from about 2012 or 13, uh, called for a meaningful role for states in decommissioning, and this revised bill uh, would also extend that public input to license transfers. So I have some one-pagers on uh, the bill um, and the contact information for our policy staffers right on there. If it's all right with the panel, I'll leave that on the table. That would be terrific. Thank you. Thank you. And I have to say that um, Haley and the other members of the congressional delegation staff are very, very helpful, and they do a lot to keep us informed about what's going on in Washington. And if, if they didn't, we probably wouldn't know as much. <laughs> so thank you. Um, Um, we're going to wait until the next meeting when people have a chance to look at it. Oh, yes. Since, oh, Haley, since there seems to be some disagreement about the need to change U.S. law to allow the cask to actually move, do you think you could provide our panel with some insight from the Senator's office on that 
question? Yes, I, I certainly uh, don't want to speak to it now, uh, but I'd be happy to check in with my policy counterpart and see if we can get some clarity there. I can Thank follow you. up with Kate if that's all right to distribute yeah. information. Yeah, and then we can. I'll, I'll probably be at the next meeting as well. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Haley. Thank you, Lissa. Um, at this point, um, I just want to mention probably just one thing, and our next meeting is on our uh, on our list of meetings is April 26. At this point, I don't know if we're going to have an April meeting or we're going to wait till May. I don't know. So if everybody can just keep April and May on your agenda or on your calendars, and hopefully within the next week, I'll have that figured out. Oh, Chris. So how does that work with the report, though? The legislative report. Do you mean we, get, we, have, we can go before without? Okay. Yeah, we have gone up and given an update to the legislature before we've gotcha. adopted the report in the past. Um, so if everybody, if that makes sense to everybody, if you can hold on until we figure out whether we're going to do April or skip April and do May or do them all, we just don't know yet. Um, is there anything else that anyone on the panel wants to mention at this point? Because if not, we can have a motion to adjourn. Um, we have a motion from Chris Campney to adjourn. Does anyone second? We have a motion, or we have June Tierney seconding that motion, so all in favor of adjourning, please say aye. aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. And the public keep, we'll let everybody know when our next meeting is, but 